The essence of gratitude is um, understanding that every moment of your life is something to be grateful for. And that everything that shows up in your life is something that you will want to be expressing a sense of gratitude about. I speak often about how we take things for granted. And taking things for granted is one of the obstacles to having an attitude of gratitude. Taking things for granted very often, I mean, I've often said that I think we should have special days every year in which we appreciate all the different aspects of our being. You know, like we give thanks for our liver on Mondays, you know, on the 3rd of January, Liver Appreciation Day. You know, or just try to imagine what it would be like if you didn't have that liver. There would be nothing for you to imagine. And then, you know, for the air that we breathe, and for the ground that we walk upon, and for gravity, and for the food that we have, and for the sky, and for, you know, our eyelids, which we just take for granted. Without them, how difficult it would be for us to get through even an hour of our day. And our toenails, and, uh, and everything about ourselves to begin to experience a sense of gratitude. Now, when we're talking about affirmations and we're talking about manifestation, here we want to look at what it is we are asking to have manifested for ourselves. And remember, we are not creating anything. We're just redistributing, if you will. Everything that needs to be created is already in the universe. There's no place to go. I remember when uh, the story was told of, uh, of Swami Muktananda, great spiritual teacher who was dying. And all of his devotees and students gathered around and he was leaving. And he had announced that. His students were praying with him and they were pleading with him, please don't go, please don't go, Swami. Please, we're not ready for you to leave. And he opened his eye and looked at them and said, don't be silly. Where could I go? Where is there to go? Everything is already here. And so, when you are manifesting and you are asking for things to show up in your life, as they begin to show up in your life, learning to be grateful for those. Now, that's not so difficult. Most of us say, thank you. I have a little ritual that I do every day. And that is, uh, almost every day, God sends money to me in some form particularly when I'm running. It happens virtually every day of my life. And it's a little game, a mental game that I have played with myself. I'll be out running, and I'll be thinking about all of the abundance that has shown up in my life and how grateful I am and how grateful I am to have my children. One of the things that my wife and I practice regularly is telling our children how fortunate we feel to be their parents, how lucky we are, not how lucky they are to have us as parents, <laughs> But how, how blessed and how grateful we are. And I'll often pick up my little boy or one of my little girls and just put my arms around and say, you know, I am really lucky to have you. you know, I'm really blessed to have you show up in my life. I feel that way about all my children. And having that kind of attitude is something that I do with everything that has shown up in my life. Because I lived a big hunk of my life without a lot of abundance with a great deal of scarcity. But even while I was living in scarcity, there was never a sense of uh, poor me, or I wish I had more, or even looking at other people and saying, they've got it and I don't. That attitude keeps you from being grateful for what you have. Even as a child, I didn't learn to say, oh, they've got a Cadillac and I have to, we have to drive around in an old Chevy or something. It was a sort of an internal knowing that you haven't earned a Cadillac. You know, that isn't something that you even think about as being yours. They used to talk about being able to buy a Cadillac when I was a young man, you know, buying my first car, and they said a Cadillac cost uh, almost $4,000. I, mean, I couldn't comprehend a Cadillac costing $4,000 and having $4,000 to buy a car. I mean, it wasn't like something I would even give a moment's notice to. If other people had that, that, that was just their karma or that was their uh, benefits or somehow they had done something to earn that. Now, today, when I go to buy a car, $4,000 is an option. 
<laughs> you want this stereo system instead of this one? That'll cost four thousand extra. All right, throw it in. What do, what do I? You know, it's got extra speakers. I mean, I mean, my first car was an, an old 1950 Plymouth that uh, had uh, you know rusted outsides on it, and uh, and I washed that thing every day, and I was so proud of. It. I was so excited about that. And the idea of looking at somebody else's new car and thinking that there was something wrong here, that they had it and I didn't, couldn't have occurred to me. And I believe it's that attitude of being grateful for whatever shows up in your life that allows additional things to show up in your life. And my little ritual that I play every day when I'm out running is uh, little coins that I find in the street. I found one this morning when I was running before I made this presentation. Right out in front of the, uh, of the hotel. A penny, a shiny penny. And you know, I have a... Uh, I've never admitted this in public before, <laughs> but I have a large jar of coins that is hidden behind in, in a bookcase behind um, a whole. Nobody knows where this is except myself. And this contains all of the money that I have found in the last 20 years. And it's a huge amount of money. Some of it is wrinkled up bills. A lot of it is foreign money because I've run in foreign countries. And most of the coins are dirty and uh, they've been out on the street for a long time. And there's a couple of $20 bills. There's a $100 bill in there. And every time I look at that, that little symbol that just keeps growing, it reminds me to be grateful. And when I pick up one of those coins, I always say, thank you, God, for this symbol of abundance that has shown up in my life. Thank you. And I put it in my pocket, and I put it away in a special way. And then when I get back to my office, I go to that little place, and I put it in there, and I look at that. And that's my reminder. What gratitude does is it keeps you connected to that source, which brings things into your life. It keeps that connection open. Another new way of being for me is to think of yourself in terms of personal authority rather than being an authoritarian. Personal authority. A person who has authority never needs to dominate anyone else, ever. Dominating doesn't become necessary. In business, you can have authority. The people who have the most authority are the ones who listen the most and the ones who are the most conscientious about what do other people have to say. A person in a relationship who has to dominate somebody else and has to make the other person submissive shows that they don't have authority because they're getting their power not from within for themselves but on the basis of who they can control. And that never lasts. That never lasts. The only thing that lasts is having inner power, if you will. Know thyself. That's what Shakespeare said. Know thyself. The more you know yourself, the more you... The more you become honest with yourself, uh, honesty becomes just a way of life. No, I don't think the world necessarily does, but you can't run your world. You can't run your world based upon what the rest of the people in the world want or don't want. To me, honesty is like it's a karma that goes out into the world. How people treat you in the world is their karma. How you react is yours. And what, when you react to it with dishonesty, that's what you're putting out into the world, dishonesty. And when you put dishonesty out into the world, that's what's going to come back to you because what goes out is what comes back that all as you sow so shall you reap i mean it's it's in every great uh institution that there is in the world whether it's a religion or a philosophy or whatever what you put out is what comes back whatever you plant is what you're going to get back and the more that you put out honesty just because it's what you are because you are being honesty you're not trying to be honest you're just being honesty then that's what will come back to you on a regular basis and when it doesn't You'll just see that as another test for you to pass. For me, it has become a way of life. It's called serenity instead of acquisitions. The more you try to acquire, the more you try to get, the more you try to collect in your life and evaluate yourself on the basis of that, the less serenity you're going to have. More is less. It's almost a secret of the universe. Serenity means inner peace it means that you can uh, find joy in every moment that you have in your life instead of always looking for it it means that uh, while you are uh, uh, 
driving along the countryside, you know, and seeing uh, instead of saying, "Oh, I've, this is I'm on my way to this point," that you can open your eyes and see it with new eyes. See, see the rolling mountains, see the grass, see the deer, see the sky. See, you can just stop wherever you are in this second, wherever you are, and just look around you, and you can begin to appreciate just your and your surroundings and your environment. Then you can begin to appreciate the people that are in your life, and even the ones that are negative. And, and that you're having the most difficulty with. You can practice a new way of being with them, which is sending them love, sending them flowers, send them books, send them a tape, send them something, and just see what kind of reaction that you get. Super emotional health is just an attitude, and attitude is everything. And it's being personally an, an authority on yourself, rather than authoritarian and trying to be dominant, dominating someone else, or to be dominated, and serenity. Which is the name of my little girl, my youngest daughter, Serena, um, rather than acquisitions and accumulations and trying to prove yourself that way. And when you get that serenity, which comes from the way that you think always, then you will replace all of the other junk that keeps you back here between six and one on that clock. And once you pass it, once you get past it, you'll never ever be able to go back because the light, living in the light. Is a way of it's a way of being that if you're not there, you don't get it yet. But once you see it, and once it begins to and take over your life, you can never go back. That that is your purpose. It isn't your purpose isn't to try to be loving. Your purpose is to be loved, and only have that to give away. Choosing to experience peace by focusing on what you are for. You can experience peace by balancing all that transpires around you with God consciousness. There's nothing that requires you to react to evil doing with a non-spiritual mental response. You have a choice to put your mental energy into what you desire, and in so doing, create a new world. Let me tell you how I choose to respond to the bombardment of messages that focus on what's wrong in the world. First, I remind myself that for every act of evil, there are a million acts of kindness. I choose to believe that people are essentially good, and that by staying in this belief system, I help bring more of this consciousness to fruition. When enough of us take on this notion, we'll learn to live collectively in this peaceful awareness. Secondly, I know for certain that no amount of hatred in my heart will ever bring about peace. Hatred will only contribute more to the presence of those human-made destructive energies. So I choose to place my attention on what I am for, and on my feeling good. I support peace, not war. As Albert Einstein once remarked, "I am not only a pacifist but a militant pacifist. Nothing will end war unless the people themselves refuse to go to war." Unquote. I, as a recipient of the Einstein Award from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University, would humbly add, "And unless people refuse to ever think warlike thoughts." In *Long Walk to Freedom*, Nelson Mandela wrote, "To make peace with an enemy, one must work with that enemy, and that enemy becomes one's partner." I know that we are all partners with each other. This is how I think, and when I see footage of a world that's in disarray, because many have forgotten this, I still choose to know that we'll ultimately learn to live this way collectively. But it begins with each of us refusing to be instruments of non-peace in all of our thoughts and, consequently, all of our behaviors. Adolf Hitler's designated successor, Hermann Göring, is quoted in Nuremberg Diary as saying, "Why, of course, the people don't want war, but after all, it's the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it's always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it's a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship, voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy." All you have to do is tell them that they're being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. That was Hermann Göring. I choose not to be one of those people who are dragged along. I refuse to be brought to the bidding of any leader who attempts to convince me that my beliefs in peace make me unpatriotic. When an unidentified Pentagon official was asked why the U.S. military censored graphic footage from the Gulf War, he responded. If we let people see that kind of thing, there would never again be any war. Well, that's my goal: to live in a world where warlike thoughts are impossible because we're placing all of our mental energy on what we are for rather than on what we hate. Former President Dwight Eisenhower, who was also a commander of the Allies in World War II, once remarked, 
Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. This is a call to get ourselves and our world in balance. Peace demands heroic thinking and a purity of conscience. Third, when I see and hear evil, I remind myself, I didn't sign up to come here to be a part of hatred. While others obviously have, I'll remember to stay with the inner sense of peace that calls to me, and I'll surround those who behave in evil ways with the same light energy. I simply refuse to go to war in my thoughts. I choose to be a beacon of light for the places of darkness that are bereft of this kind of illuminating energy. Finally, as the dispatches of violence continue to come my way, I remind myself over and over again that we have a choice in how we respond to all of this. I know that by feeling hateful in response to hate, I only contribute to the presence of hatred in the world. As an ancient Chinese proverb tells us, quote, if you decide to pursue revenge, you'd better dig two graves, unquote. I know that I have a choice to see what's good about the world rather than what has gone wrong. When those communiques of violence and hatred come streaming toward me, I push the mute button or even the off button, and I recall what the Dalai Lama once said, quote, Compassion and love are not mere luxuries. As the source of both inner and outer peace, they are fundamental to the continued survival of our species, unquote. Those are extremely valuable words describing our need to be in balance. I stay balanced on this dimension of being in a peaceful world, by saying them over and over and over again. I now know for certain that I am obliged to stay in a consciousness of compassion and love, not only to maintain my own balance, but to help ensure the continued survival of our species. There can be no greater calling. It's, all of it is there to teach us something, something grand and something delightful, and that helps us move to higher and more spiritual places. So the way that you adver <coughs> eliminate adversity is literally to be thankful for it and to say thank you for everything, everything that is showing up in my life. Uh, it is going to teach me something, something profound. And some of the most difficult and, and very troublesome kinds of things that have occurred to me in my life, what I thought were at the time, have taught me how to be a better writer, a better speaker, a, a kinder person, a, a better human being. Because true nobility, it's not about being better than other people. It's about being better than you used to be. And the way that you get better at being the, uh, you know, than you used to be is by having these challenges show up and then, uh, and then transcending them and get overcoming them. I don't look back on my days of drinking, which uh, stopped 17 years ago, as anything other than great, great and wonderful events that helped me. All of that drinking and all of the behavior and the drugs that I did and all of those kinds of things have helped me to become a stronger, more purified, uh, more, more decent, better human being, better husband, better father, better, better, uh, you know, better speaker, uh, better man as a person. Anyway, you... let me try to get through the rest of these. We just have a few moments. Left. Okay. Were you going to say something, Diane? Well, I was going to say, do you think people get caught up in the why me kind of mentality? Yeah, I think they do. Instead of saying, why not me? You know, so thank right. you. Thank you for all of it. Every single bit of it. I mean, there's a slogan here on Maui that says, no rain, no rainbows. You know, so I always remind people of that whenever there's a rainy day and the tourists are all here and they're all upset about the rain. I say, but you see all those rainbows that you just love every day? They have rainbows over here on the island. You can't have them without the rain. And I think it's a good symbol for our lives. Um, one of the things that Gandhi said uh, that's really, tr I think, very important is that there's more to life than, than making things go faster and making it always uh, increase our speed. That the idea that we have to get there fast, we have to be ahead of the other person, slowing ourselves down in the, in the, in the 26 verse of the Tao that I was writing about this morning, uh, it talks about the stillness, about, about being able to, uh, that, that stillness is the, is the mother of unrest. In other words, in order, the master of unrest. In other words, in order to be able to get to a place where you are no longer filled with unrest, you have to go to this place of stillness, this place of quiet, this place of peace that is within each and every one of us. And that means not telling yourself that you have to be there ahead of the other guy, not rushing through the traffic lights, but meditating your way through the, when a yellow light comes, instead of rushing through it, instead, you know, that, that's just a habit. Instead of that, just slowing down, putting your foot on the brake and saying, thank you. Thank you for one minute to just sit here and be at peace and be kind and be, and be in, a, in a sense of harmony with my source, which is always at peace. Also, I said, do everything that you, 
that do everything that you can to eliminate debt in your life because all of the debt that you have, the credit card debt, the money that you owe, the banks, the mortgages, all of those kinds of things are a way of giving up control of your life and putting it into the hands of someone who, who will be controlling the purse strings of your life. And also to let go of your idea about everything uh, is evaluated on the basis of how much it costs or how much it's worth. Uh, try to take the dollar value off of things and just enjoy everything in your life for what it is. I'm actually, I'm going through something right now, and I'm kind of wanting to know why all this is happening to me in my life. At 15, my dad died unexpectedly of, you know, uh, an aortic aneurysm, and then we, I dealt with that somewhat decent. I don't want to say great, but I was only 15, and then I got married, and my husband and I struggled for four and a half years to get pregnant with one miscarriage along the way. And we got pregnant in November last year. We found out December 8th. And then on April 4th, we found out that the baby was really sick. Mm -hmm. And I ended up delivering a stillborn on April 19th. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not quite sure why all this is happening and how to get through it. Yeah, I, I can hear your pain. Um, first of all, you, 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 you know, as you, as you move along the, the, this path that I'm writing about, especially on inspiration, you, you find out that... Um, all of the greatest teachers who've ever walked among us, including Jesus, uh, all of them, have uh, taught us that death is not a, it's not a punishment, that it is, it, is, uh, it is the inevitability of all things, that everything that composes decomposes. And the question is, isn't whether it's going to decompose. The question that we have as human beings is, how long is it going to take? How much time do we get? Uh, when you say the words, my father died unexpectedly, my immediate response to that is unexpected to you. Yes. Yeah. But not to God, and not you know, and that the moment that your father was conceived, and the moment that he showed up in this planet, his birth was here, uh, independent of his opinion about it, and so was his death. And the same is true of the of the miscarriages that you've had, and the and the stillborn, the stillbirths that you've had. That um, that there's a perfection in all of this, and that these souls who who showed up very very temporarily, and then for whatever reason, uh, that none of us will ever be privy to. Um, weren't ready to show up in, into this into this world. What happened? What you are doing with it is you're taking it personally. You're 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 saying to yourself, "Why me? And how could something so terrible as this happen? And how much of this kind of thing do I have to put up with before I'll have peace in my life?" And I'm saying yeah. to you, have peace in your life now, and 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 even be in a state of gratitude for the, just the fact that you've been able to you've been able to participate in the dance of life. You've already created life twice. Uh, and, and because it didn't last as long as you thought it should last, um, it's just, a, it's, that's, just a, that's just our ego at work. That Let it chase you. Let it follow you instead of being something that you're consumed with having to get. Because the more you're attached to the outcome, the more you're trying to get something that isn't what you really want. And this idea of knowing that that divine intelligence will work in exactly the order and the preference and the time that it is supposed to. In The Course in Miracles, there's this often quoted passage that says, uh, infinite patience produces immediate results. And it sounds like it's a uh, contradiction, doesn't it? It sounds like a paradox. If I'm patient, infinitely patient, then I will have to wait a very long time. And this idea of attempting to hurry along the divine intelligence is something that we do with our egos all the time. Obviously, creation reveals its secrets by and by. By and by. As it is supposed to, as it is ordained. This principle of detaching ourselves from outcome along with having infinite patience is really essential to your manifestation process. It is inconsistent with what we have a tendency to think is the way things should be working. Because if I do everything that I'm supposed to, if I follow all of these principles and I set down all the rules and I get it all organized, then I expect that I'll have results. That's the time in our lives that I referred to earlier in the very first principle of uh, being the warrior, going from the athlete to the warrior. 
That's the time in our lives when we set our goals. And there's nothing wrong with setting goals. I've written about it and talked about it on many programs right here at Nightingale Comet and in many of my books. But the idea of thinking that setting goals and then just going about and having them show up is still the thinking that keeps us sort of stuck back at the warrior phase of our development. It inhibits us from moving to higher places, higher places wherein we can, uh, we can begin to manage the coincidences of our lives, which sounds like a uh, contradiction, doesn't it? If it's a coincidence, you can't manage it. If you're managing it, then it's not a coincidence. But when you begin to transcend some of these paradoxes, when you reach a higher level. So setting goals is one thing, and it's, a, it's something that we do at the, in the earlier stages of our, our spiritual development. And we continue to do it. And these stages that I talked about earlier are not things that we go into and then never go back to. We go back. We come out of it, we go back, we're always moving in and out of these stages. The question is, what is my primary emphasis? Is my primary emphasis not only on setting goals, but in falling in love with those goals, and then insisting that those goals show up when I want them to show up? That is inconsistent with manifestation and with spirituality and higher consciousness. What you have to do is have your goals, which is what a tomato seed is, it's really a goal for tomatoes. But you have to then relax and turn your thoughts and your ideas and your consciousness and your awareness to your own purpose and know in your heart that it will manifest. You see, the key to relaxing about what it is that you would like to see manifested is the certainty of the outcome. If you have a certainty, as it says in The Course in Miracles, if you have a certainty of the outcome, patience is easy. If you are uncertain of the outcome, if you're not sure how it's going to work out, or if things are going to fall into place the way you would like them to, if you have that uncertainty, then you will not be able to be patient. So patience, infinite patience, is really like a trusting in God. And when you trust in God, you're trusting in the wisdom that created you. And when you trust in the wisdom that created you, you're trusting in yourself as well. Because you can never be separate from that wisdom. So patience and trust and awareness and higher consciousness are absolutely essential. You may believe that the opposite of love is hate. I do not see these two emotions as opposites. In fact, love and hate are often closely aligned. To me, the opposite of love is fear. When you have fear, you do not have love. Ego uses fear as a way to keep authentic love out of your life. When love is not present in your life, you have succumbed to ego and allowed fear in where love could be. You have allowed ego to replace God. Learning to experience authentic love means abandoning ego's insistence that you have much to fear and that you are in an unfriendly world. This begins with an assessment of your reluctance to embrace love. If you are not experiencing love in your life right now, it is because you are, in some way, afraid. You need to examine your fears with honesty and with love. When you do, you will transform your fears into love. You will open up a space within you that can only be occupied by love. In this space you are on purpose, walking the way of the sacred self. But first, you must see how you substitute fear for love. Your ego steadfastly promotes fear because it fears authentic love itself. This false self helps you convince yourself that you are in some way incomplete. That is the source of all fear. Afraid of having your emptiness, your incompleteness exposed, you expend a lot of energy creating a false image of happiness. The fear about exposing the emptiness keeps you seeking relationships that ego tells you will satisfy the longing within you. What happens is that you enter a relationship, starved for the love that is your higher self. Your inner hunger is masked, pretending to be something else. No wonder so many people repeatedly think they have found love and repeatedly declare they've lost it. How different it is when you can notice the inner emptiness and think, what's not to like? This longing is part of being human and knowing love. 
Then you will let ego know that fear is not your choice. Love is your choice. Just imagine how our system might be if people knew they were already complete. What would you need to purchase? What would you need to have to own? Who would you have to impress? Who would you need to have on your arm? The answers give you an idea of how much we rely on the fear that we are incomplete and unacceptable as we are, and how unaware we are of our divine connection. The fear that is a substitute for love is simply a fear of being unacceptable. Virtually all fears can be traced directly back to self-esteem. If you love yourself, you will be able to transform your fears with love rather than allow them to direct your life. If you have an inner feeling of being complete and whole, knowing the loving presence that is there, then fear becomes a loving invitation to know more or to change something in your life. Fear will no longer threaten you as it did when you are unacquainted with your higher self. The inability to rely on the love that is our very essence shows up in many forms. Your ego wants you to believe that you are unacceptable and will gleefully assist you in creating an image to prove that it is so. Manifestations like obesity and personal slovenliness and eating disorders often are the fear-based projection of yourself. Ego can influence you to shun all efforts to be loved by others by refusing to allow the risk of an intimate encounter or the development of an intimate relationship. Ego often makes you selfishly pursue your own goals at others' expenses. You engage in perpetual conversation about yourself. We often use economic, social, and other types of excuses to defend behavior that does not extend love. For instance, you might excuse unloving or inconsiderate behavior because it's only my job or because everyone else does it. Expressions of disgust or rudeness towards others are based on ego. They are heard in stores, on freeways, in offices, at airports, in restaurants, any place you are in your daily life. These are some of the common expressions of a fear-based ego struggling to keep you away from the experience of love that is your true essence. Before you begin to change these behaviors and thought patterns, you need to examine the payoffs. What is some part of your receiving as a payoff for listening intently to ego? Your ego works for its living. Its payoff is not money, but just in keeping alive. Your ego is not open to making contact with God because it would be immediately put out of business. Your ego is in direct conflict with your true purpose for being there. You are here to give and receive love. Your ego protects you from that vision by keeping you in a belief system that declares you are separate and special. By hanging on to the fears of your insufficiency, you can avoid taking any risks. As long as you have self-doubt and all of its attendant fears, you are guaranteed to stay in servitude to your false self. Your ego thrives on guilt. Your higher self knows that you should forgive yourself, learn from mistakes, and release feelings of fear and anxiety. But ego hands you guilt so that it will thrive. Guilt is the inner fear that you should pay a price for any and all mistakes you have committed in your life. Thus the ego convinces you that you must feel guilty and it keeps you removed from your true spirit. Your ego doesn't reject love. The polite background ego voice whispers that love is a high ideal, but one that is loaded with danger. It warns you to not give too much love because you may be taken advantage of. Because you are so special, it tells you others want to take advantage of you. Ego promotes inauthentic love. In your relationships with others, your ego convinces you that your partner is just what you need to fill the emptiness within you. This is a great ruse that will forever keep you from knowing love and peace. Make a copy of this passage from Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Tape it to your mirror and read it every morning will help stimulate the inner opening to the love you seek and dissolve fears if you are willing to do what the poet suggests. He says, I exist as I am, that is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. And if each and all be aware, I sit content. One world is aware, and by far the largest to me, and that is myself. And whether I come to my own today or in 10,000 or 10 million years, I can cheerfully take it now or with equal cheerfulness, I can wait. Remind yourself that God created you in perfect love that is changeless and eternal. As you recognize and affirm this aloud each day, you will lose your fear of inadequacy and incompleteness. Constantly recalling the affirmation of being a creation of God beyond the world of the manifest will chase the fears away. Forgive yourself and welcome love back into your life. And in the New Testament, it says, Do not be conformed to this life, but be transformed of it. 
An interesting notion. And what is all matter on our planet, and how is it created, other than that which was given to us by God? What is it? All matter is through form, an idea, a thought, a thought. I want to invent chalk, I want to make a microphone, I have a thought. And then I manipulate through my form and create matter. What did Jesus do? What did Buddha do? What did Sai Baba do? What did great spiritual leaders do? Do you believe in the miracles of those spiritual people? I mean, do you really believe? Christ said, all that I can do, you can do, and greater things. How many of you believe in this room that those miracles really happened or that they're just fiction? How many believe that they really happened? I do too. I know that I can do them too. <laughs> I wonder how many of you know that you are capable of miracles. Miracles. I'm not here to preach religion at all. I'm here to talk about transformation. What is materializing an object? What is changing water into wine? What is that? But a transformation. It is not using the form, going beyond it. Now where is the place in your life where there are no boundaries? There is no limit. No limit whatsoever. The only boundaries we have are in form. And as long as you believe you are form, you're going to always have boundaries and obstacles. When a woman said to me in a church, what are the obstacles to my achieving full happiness? I said, the belief that you have to have obstacles. That's all. The connection between thinking and creating something for yourself is really there. It isn't just some mystical kind of hocus-pocus thing that's out there, but that you can use this vibrational pattern that we call thought, which is so instantaneous. You can literally make anything happen that you want to by the power of your ability to think. You're tuning into some kind of vibrational pattern that is there for everything, and none of us can escape that. The ultimate in that is miracles, is being able to produce miracles. And that's just one simple little example of it. There are many, many other things in this higher self business or transformation or in this awakening process that are only complicated and difficult because we can't see behind it. We can't see the perfect energy that is behind the form. We can't see the perfect intelligence. There's an intelligence behind form. There's an intelligence behind a fish in water and the gills and how it works. There's an intelligence behind a plant that grows in a certain kind of way. There's a life there, and in that life form, there's intelligence behind that. We miss that intelligence because we're so preoccupied with just what I can see, how I can get a hold of it, and, and hence the title of this program. You'll only see it when you believe it. You'll see it when you believe it. If you only believe what you see, then you are limited to just what is on the surface, and you don't even believe in the intelligence behind anything. But if you believe that you'll see it when you believe it, and when you start expecting and knowing that there's a special intelligence in the universe behind everything that has life in it, and you begin to behave as if the perfection in all life really matters, and you begin to know that that is real for each one of us, then what happens is you're looking beyond what everybody else sees. And all of a sudden you start seeing miracles happening in your life that are just astounding to you. And at one time they were just thought of as coincidences or, oh yeah, but that's weird, but you can't really make that happen. And you start to get to a point in your life where you see that you are much more than just this stuff that you can get a hold of, this form, the five senses that we have, the ability to see and to touch and to smell and this kind of thing. And you begin to know that who you are is much greater than that, much more divine than that, much bigger than that. And it's like you can't ever get a hold of a thought. You can never touch a feeling. You can't come home with a basket full of thoughts or an armload of feelings. Yet you know they're there, and you know that that's how your whole life is. Your whole life is in this realm. Then you begin to look for that special intelligence or that special love. We have so much trouble putting a label on it. And you begin to see it in all life. And you begin to then think in accepting and loving and kind ways towards everything and everyone that has life in it. And before long, you're creating out of that love, out of that special harmony that you are and that is you, you're creating new kinds of relationships and you're creating new kinds of loves and new kind of excitement in your life. And then before long, you're making things happen that you never thought could happen before. And then you start expecting miracles instead of being surprised by them. And your whole life changes. A lot of people are looking for the how-tos. 
you know, how can I become a more spiritual person? Or how can I find my purpose? Uh, and they start with the way that they learn anything. Problem solving logic. A plus B plus C plus D equals whatever it is. And, and you just go through the steps. It's not like that. When you consider that everything that you have done in your life has led you up until this moment that you have right now, and all of the things that you have assessed to be negative, all of the addictions perhaps that you've had, all of the problems you've had in your marriages, all the problems you've had with your children, all of the weight problems perhaps that you've had, all of the difficulties that have come your way, the financial concerns and the bankruptcies and all of the stuff that if you were to reach into your bag, you know, you could pull out this whole bag full of uh, negative stuff. You get to a point that the Buddhists call satori, S-A-T-O-R-I, satori. It means um, instant enlightenment, instant enlightenment. And the Buddhists believe, by and large, that enlightenment is something that happens in instants. It happens in moments. It's like I've talked about at some of my other tapes about going through the gate. You know, it's like on one side of the gate is uh, the path that is strewn with thorns, all right? And there's all of the stuff that I have just described. And then there's this gate ahead of you. And then on the other side of the gate is this garden. And there's this flowers, and it's just magnificent, and there's happiness, and there's bliss, and there's fulfillment, and there's all of this wonderful stuff on the other side. But you can't get through the gate. And then comes the moment in your life when you go through the gate. You just go through. You know, the thorns that were there don't matter anymore. The obstacles are no longer obstacles. It's just a, and it's like, boom, instantaneously, you are now on a different path altogether. I can tell you that for those of you who are struggling and trying to find a formula and trying to get it all into A, B, C, D, E, F, it isn't that way. First of all, all of the thorns and all of the obstacles that have been created in your life are there for a reason, even though it's, it, that's a hard thing for us to accept. There's something to be learned from each one of those. And so instead of saying, how can I avoid these in the future, you reprocess your life in a different way and say, I created this for what reason? And I'm going through this because, and you fill in the blanks, or the lesson in this for me is, right, instead of why is this happening to me and isn't this awful and so on. And then satori happens. And I mean, that was very revealing for me to read about this instant enlightenment. Because every major change that I've made in my life, I mean, they don't seem like major, big changes, but the changes that I've made in my, happened in instants. I mean, just in seconds. Now, in the physical world of changes that I have made, I can remember when I first decided that I was going to start running and exercising and get myself in shape instead of being overweight and out of shape like I had been. In an instant, in an instant, and it was a doctor at a hospital where I wasn't a patient. I was working there. I was training the staff in group therapy at North Shore Hospital on Long Island. And this doctor said one thing to me. He said, uh, if you continue on the path that you're on, you're going to be a candidate for a heart attack in five years. He wasn't trying to be helpful to me. He wasn't anything. He just was making a statement. And that evening, I went out and I ran for the first time as an adult. And it's now almost 15 years later. And I haven't missed a day of running in 15 years. It was just like an instant kind of thing. And then it was like carrying through on that. And, I mean, that really flies in the face of a lot of the stuff that we hear all the time about you have to have a goal and you have to have a plan and you have to get it all figured out and you have to work step by step by step. I really think that enlightenment or discovering this inner source of strength is something that just happens in an instant whenever you're ready. So whoever you are, I mean, if you're smoking, if you're drinking excessively, if you've got addictive habits in your eating habits and so on, if you are behaving in ways with your children or with your wife or, or co-workers or whatever, and you think that it's just hopeless and that you can't change and that it's just too difficult to process and so on, I'm really saying to you that in an instant you can decide to radically alter your life. And it isn't like even a decision-making process. You're now ready. The same Buddhists say that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And in your dream you had... Uh 
oh, all these different characters, and, and you had all of this money, and you had everything that you wanted in your dream. And then you woke up. And then you look back at your dream, and you became attached to the stuff that you had in your dream. And you said, wait a minute, I want that. There was gold in there. There was silver. There was all of these friends. I had a Ferrari there. I mean, all of this. I got to have that. Somebody would come away and cart you off and put you in a rubber room and say, that was a dream. You can't be attached to that. That's just a thought that you have. That's the way you got to view life. Instead of it being an eight-hour dream, it's an 80-year dream or a 90-year dream. And at the end of the dream, you don't want to be looking back at all of the stuff that you wish you could still have because you can't have it. <laughs> you don't get any of that. So you try to detach yourself now while you're here, while you're alive, from the need to have that stuff. Instead, you just let it sort of all flow. As absurd as it would be for you to be attached to the stuff that you had in your dream, it's that absurd for you to be attached to the stuff that you're having in this dream. <laughs> you have to die while you're alive. Now, that's a very hard concept for people to get. But you have to experience your own death while you're alive. Let me tell you a story. It's a wonderful story. It's an old, ancient story. I'll paraphrase it. There was a, a hunter who lived in India, and he would go to Africa every two years, and he would bring back animals and prizes and things like that. Well, one year he took off and he went to the jungle, and he discovered this large enclave inside the jungle, and it was filled with beautiful parrots, beautiful birds, multicolored, and they all talked, and he couldn't get over it. And he put a net out over one of the trees, and he captured one of the parrots. And he put the parrot in a cage. And he brought the parrot back to be with him in India as his pet. And he fed the parrot sunflower seeds, and he fed him rice, and he took wonderful care of him. He was very good. Kept him in the cage. Two years went by, and he talked to the parrot every day. And he said to the parrot... I'm now going back to Africa. Is there anything you would like me to say to your friends back there in the jungle when I'm back there? The parrot said, yes. Tell them that I'm very happy in my cage. Tell them that I'm joyful and that I love being in my cage here with you. Just tell them that. The hunter went back to Africa. He went back to the place in the jungle where he had been two years before. And he told the story. He said, your friend that I took back has a message for you. And the message is that he is happy in his cage, that he is joyful with me, and that he has no regrets. At the instant of hearing that, a bird on one of the branches keeled over and dropped dead. Dropped dead. <laughs> Stiff. The hunter assumed that he was just filled with sorrow at hearing of what had happened to his uh, friend. So he went back to India, and he told his parrot what had happened. He said, I went back, and I did just as you said. And I told them all out there. And at the moment that I told it, apparently one of the parrots was so upset that he had missed you so much that he just dropped dead. And at the instant that that happened, the parrot in the cage keeled over dead. His legs went straight up in the air, and he went stiff. The hunter was beside himself. He, he couldn't figure out how could this happen. And he took the dead parrot out of the cage, opened it up, and threw it out on the woodpile. The instant that the parrot landed on the woodpile, he flew up to the branch. And the hunter said, you tricked me. What is this? I thought you were dead. And the parrot said... My friend was sending me a message. He told me, by his actions, that in order for you to escape from your cage, you must die while you're alive. Okay, now that's an old story. That's an ancient story that's been told over the years. What does it mean? <laughs> I mean, don't you see that this is a cage? that the whole planet is a cage, if you can just stand back far enough and see that we're still restricted by the limitations placed on us as human beings. 
we're stuck here or maybe in our homes or in wherever we are, we're all in cages. And even though we have more room to manipulate, we may even have a whole planet, we're still sort of in cages. Now, how do you escape from the cage that you're in? You have to die while you're alive. You have to literally experience your own death. All of us have to. All of us are going to die. So why not experience it in advance and see yourself out of your body, gone, but able to look back at what's going on now, just like the dream, where you have the dream and you have everything you want, but you're able to look back at it. As you do that, you begin to see the folly, the absurdity of hanging on to anything, of being attached to anything of needing anything, of telling yourself that I can't be happy if, from the perspective of having died, but being able to look back on it just like the dream. As soon as you can do that, as soon as you can experience yourself formless, dimensionless, form and all of the attendant things that you hang on to become irrelevant. They're not necessary any longer. You have a whole new way of living, a new way of being.